The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. This series is sponsored jointly by Metron and George Mason. Uh, presenter today is Professor Yannick II of George Mason University. She's going to talk about visual representations for navigation and object detection. Now, Yannick Koseka is a professor at the Department of Computer, Computer Science at George Mason University. She obtained a PhD in Computer Science from the University of Pennsylvania. Following that, she was a postdoctoral fellow at the Double E Computer Science Department at the University of California, Berkeley. She is chair of the IEEE Technical Committee on Robot Perception, associate editor of the IEEE Robotics and Automation Letters and International Journal of Computer Vision, former editor of the IEEE Transactions on Pattern Analysis and Machine Intelligence. She has held visiting positions at Stanford University, Google, and Nokia <coughs> Professor Koseka is a co-author of a monograph titled Invitation to 3D Vision, from Images to Geometric Models. Professor Koseka. Thank you. Well, thank you very much for the introduction and invitation. I'm very delighted to speak to you and tell you a little bit about some of our current work and how we got here and also a little bit where I think the field of robot perception is going. So, I feel we are in a really exciting times and um, you know you can probably whether you work on these problems or not a lot of these things you already hear from the news so big advances have been made in autonomous driving uh, a lot of companies in manufacturing uh, are sort of thinking of using the robotic technologies to do the packing and, and delivery and uh, we sort of have capabilities of sort of recognizing and understanding better the image content. And a lot of this progress has been sort of propelled by uh, the advancements in sort of data-driven techniques for machine learning. And my interest in, is in robot perception and computer vision as applied to the perception of robots. And so I'm gonna talk a little bit about how some of the advancements which have been made uh, in computer vision apply to the robot perception. That's, and I'll also give you a little bit of a tour. So what is robot perception? So robot perception is sort of the capability of taking uh, multiple sensing modalities, uh, range sensing, visual sensing, single images and videos, and ask these questions, what, where, and now. So basically trying to do some image analysis and image understanding both over time or uh, even from the single view. And these entailed problems like 3D reconstructions, visual geometry, sort of localization using visual sensing. So these things are sort of basic ingredients of any self-driving vehicles and are sort of deployed, deployed in production very successfully. Then it is the problem of recognizing object categories and instances, so trying to get hold a little bit of the semantic content in images, uh, trying to estimate the pose. So sometimes it's not enough just to say there is an object or a car in an image, but you would like to know what is the orientation, what is the heading, and where the object is going. So this is very important for prediction. Um, then furthermore, if you want to go into a little bit more detail, you also would like to understand a little bit the context where objects reside and this is typically provided by this problem of semantic segmentation so this is the problem of assign a label to every pixel in an image so you not you do not only know about the object but you also know about uh, roads and trees and, and buildings um, which is the context where the object resides and so the advantage of so looking at some of these problems in the context of robotics that you, we typically have this ability to actually actively explore and control the sensor in order to um, sort of gather more useful information. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you a little bit of a tour, brief overview how we got where we are right now when it comes to these data-driven techniques and 
and deep convolutional neural networks. And I want to do it so you can see a little bit what the challenges are with that route. And then I'm going to talk a little bit about some problems which we worked on to tackle some of these challenges. And then towards the end, I will um, sort of conclude with some examples of how to use the action and vision and perception together. So how we can actually think of designing architectures and systems where the sensing and control basically works together and how to sort of think about it a little bit differently in the context of these new developments of these large data-driven techniques. All right. So these are the three problems which are the most common problems considered in computer vision and I will briefly touch up on each of them. So the first problem is sort of rather simple. It is the problem of recognition. And that problem is given an image, tell me what is in the image. So assign a single label to the image. And this is the classification problem. And if you want to have a probabilistic notation given the measurements, which is the image, determine what is the class which you are looking at. So the, for the first example, we would label this image as a motor. Like sort of with some probability, given some representation of image, we predict that we are seeing the motorbike. Then a little bit more complicated problem is the one of the detection that you not only want to say what is in the image, but you also want to say where it is, right? So this uh, requires you, in addition to predicting the class, which is the C, you also would like to predict the bounding box in the image, which is the location of the object. So there are two things which need to be estimated. The bounding box, not only the location, but also the size. So the width and height and aspect ratio. And you can imagine at the beginning, the space of this is infinite, right? You don't know what you're looking at. And then the third class is the so-called semantic segmentation where you would like to actually label or explain every pixel in the image using some semantic label categories. So this problem uh, is very useful for modeling the contextual relationships, right? Because if you want to talk, so typically in computer vision, the content is very loosely divided into the objects and stuff. So the stuff is basically the things you cannot put the bounding box around. But it is very important because if you are driving or if you are sort of navigating and looking around, it is good to know where floor is, where walls are, where vegetation is, where roads are, and we would like to be able to reliably recognize it, despite of all the difficulties and variations in lighting and weather and so forth. So these are the three problems. And the techniques sort of share some similarities, but also they're very different how they're being tackled. And right now there is some sort of convergence of all these, of all these uh, sort of ideas in order to come up with some kind of unified models and architectures which can do explanation of images uh, at this level for all these quantities. And I can talk about it a little bit later. So, so our field, and not only our field, and by our I mean the computer vision and also robot perception to some extent has been a really the workhorse of the field has since past, I guess seven years ago, became these uh, neural network models, which are based on these convolutional neural networks. And the origins of these models are, you know, go in computer vision to the late 90s, but these things have been around since the 60s and 70s. So, so the application, one of the first applications of this convolutional neural networks in computer vision was by Jan Lacan, where he was applying to this, uh, the networks to the problem of uh, US postal digit recognition. And the main idea is that instead of a traditional neural network, which typically you have some fully connected layers and, and then you make prediction, the convolutional neural networks, uh, this idea is that you actually share some of the coefficients as you sort of move the network through the, through the image. And so as a side effect, the intuition behind the coefficients of a neural network can be 
viewed, they can be viewed as filters which you are trying to convolve the image with in order to learn some representations which is useful for the detection of recognition tasks. So if you have an image, you can think of the next convolutional layer represent the feature maps, which are the results of the convolution of an image with a filter when the coefficients of the filter were learned. So the coefficients of the filters are optimized for the task. So this is very different if you, your background is in image processing. You know, we have a lot of tools and techniques how to design filters. We have wavelets, we have garbo filters and so forth. But, you know, so the question is, can we get a better filters which are specified for the task, which and, and larger amounts of them, which would sort of enable us to, to get a better accuracy. So this was kind of the general idea. The problem in the uh, late 90s is that it was very difficult. You know, you run this on CPU, there were really no data set available in order for to use this to make, you know, to in order for this methodology to to be applicable to some really interesting problems. So the computer vision field was largely dominated by approaches where people would take the problem and then they would try to hand engineer features, design data sets, and uh, you know, create some benchmarks. It was a very empirical field where um, you know, we would sort of take a lot of uh, motivation and intuition from psychology, cognitive science, neuroscience, and this was typically driving the intuition um, how to design these features. So what has changed was that in 2012 and sort of several years preceding that, the community kind of recognized that we need more data. So there was huge effort in order to build this uh, ImageNet data set which was an image net, which was a data set which had about 14 million images, about 20,000 classes. And this was a data set which was labeled, uh, you know, there was a sort of mechanical sort of interface, it was basically outsourced, and it took several years to create this data set. <laughs> but what has happened is that, and then suddenly, with the availability of the labeled data and improvements in the computational power, but because now we are in 2012, we have GPUs, we have clusters, we can run things on large amounts of machines. Suddenly, what has happened, the performance by deploying this deep convolutional neural network skyrocketed. So this is just to give you an idea. In 2000, um, so this is uh, this is the performance in 2000, 2011, 2012. So, and then this was the huge jump in 2012 when the first neural network, this deep neural network, was uh, applied, and then it kept on improving. Okay. So, so the first breakthrough was really due to this um, uh, sort of so-called AlexNet which was nothing else but a convolutional neural network, but now, you know, the network had million parameters. But the ideas were the same. I don't want to go to the sort of nitty-gritty details of the <coughs> architectures, but basically there's some combination of convolutional pooling layers and, uh, and some, um, uh, yeah, convolutional and pooling layers. And this sort of yielded this uh, dramatic improvement in the performance. So the architecture was very similar to the original convolutional neural network, but it was just much larger, much deeper, and had many more parameters. So, so what has happened is that, you know, by actually applying this methodology on this very, very large data set, it provided the researchers this mechanism instead of hand engineering these features to actually learn them for this recognition task. And what was really nice that you can actually go and gain a little bit of introspection what kind of features were learned in the process. And uh, this was sort of typically one mechanism how to visualize it that you basically look at uh, the units which are activate, which have the highest activations in the network, and then kind of trace it back to the data set to understand what are the 
part of the images which activate them. And so you can see now that the, the space of filters at the very first convolutional layers, these are nothing else but, you know, maybe 12 by 12, maybe even seven by seven filters are much broader than the kind of filters, you know, we used to use uh, in the past. And these are basically here, what's being visualized are literally the coefficients of the filters which are formed by the fewer layers. And then if you move up the layers, you can see that more higher level sort of features are being used. So then at the layer three, you have kind of patches which already correspond to kind of small faces or dots or noses, depending on what was in the data set. So this is just to give you the intuition behind what's being learned. And since then, there have been many more techniques um, trying to sort of advance this mechanism of visualizing what the network is learning. So this was great news, you know, we managed to sort of forego the tedious and difficult feature engineering but what has happened since that the feature engineering moved into an architecture engineering. So the first architecture, which was in 2012, was basically a copy of the LANET architecture from 1998. But since then, what happened? More layers, seven layers, 20 to 22 layers, 37 to 100 layers, residual connections, dense connections between the layers learning the architecture. So, so essentially, you know, all the intuitions which people have, which previously were being put into the field change engineering, in some sense, were being put into the architecture engineering. And this is just for the standard classification problem. But nevertheless, the progress has been made. So now the image net data set is about at a 3% level with, uh, you know, one of the top performing architectures. Uh, so this is the little bit of a review. So this is for the classification task. So as I mentioned, it's just give, given an image, just a return and say the label. So let's think a little bit what it entails to uh, using these techniques to solve the detection task. So the detection task is given an image. Suppose I want to know where the face is. Well, if I want to know where the face is, then I really should do an exhaustive search across each pixel in the image. And in some sense, at each location, you should solve a classification task. Is it phase or not phase? And I'm showing this to you for a single aspect ratio of the bounding box, but initially you don't know how big the face is. So you should be able to do it for, uh, you know, some, you need to somehow sample the space of bounding boxes. So this is a really daunting task. And in the past, a lot of approaches which were um, used for solving these object detection tasks were really limited by the choice of features in order to be able to do this fast, right? Because literally, you were doing this sliding window detector and you wanted to um, generate this hypothesis and learn the classifiers uh, fast. So, so let's see how to take this sliding window idea and apply it to the uh, to this deep convolutional neural network. So one simple strategy is, well, let's not consider all possible windows, but let's sample, okay? So if I sample some windows of certain aspect ratios and we can discuss techniques how to go about this sampling, then I can basically use for each window each window is then a separate image and I can feed it into the original network. But this is extremely inefficient because every time when I take a crop, I have to recompute everything and this will take a very, very long time. So this was sort of the first attempt how to go about object detection using the classical classification architectures. Well, so then, so the first advancements were in, along the following route. Well, well, I should not be really recomputing all these features for every object. I should be able to compute the features for the entire image and generate the object hypothesis at the feature level, right? So this is basically the basic tower where the features are computed using the traditional uh, techniques. These are often pre-trained using the ImageNet. 
And then you, once you have the feature maps, you generate some proposals of hypotheses where the object might be. And once the hypotheses are generated, then these networks typically have two branches. One is take the feature map which underlies the bounding box, and then one branch does the classification and the other one refines the dimensions of the binding, bounding box. So this is the bounding box regression. So these classes of approaches are the sort of the two state approaches where you first generate some hypotheses which are class agnostic where the objects are and then you take these hypotheses and you push them to the classification layer and the bounding box layer. So another class of techniques are the single stage approaches where you are basically generating, you don't have a separate this, uh, object proposal uh, network which is generating the proposals and it's often trained separately, but you simply take um, take this architecture, but make a connections between these individual layers such that the features at the lower layers and higher levels are connected. And then at each location, you generate so-called anchor boxes. So the anchor boxes are this hypothesis of the sizes of bounding boxes uh, at each location. And then the regression branch will refine them and the classification branch will generate uh, uh, will generate the best hypothesis. So, and then since then, similarly then in the classification, there were a lot of different architectures how to improve the accuracy. And the general idea of these architectures was that you really want to use the information both in the bottom upstream and top downstream in order to sort of gather as much evidence both about the object itself, but also the context where the object appears. And then you generate the, the, the predictions about the classes and, and the bounding boxes. So, so if you want to just uh, kind of look at it conceptually, these are sort of the two, this was the, this is how the individual black blocks of these deep networks look like. And again, what is appealing that you can train it all end to end. This is all operations are differentiable, so you have a data set and, and you, you go for it. So the third advancement was the one that, well, you know, for many objects, the bounding boxes are kind of a very coarse approximation because if you have articulated non-box-like objects, there are a lot of other things which end up being in the box. So the third advancement, which is very recent, is in addition to bounding boxes, you also want to predict the segmentation masses within the boxes. And so then the predictions will close. <coughs> okay. So you can see that you have, the people are really nicely outlined. You can see where the legs are. And despite all the occlusions and uh, big changes in scale, every instance is more or less correctly laid. Okay. So, so this last uh, class of models, in addition to optimizing for the classes, which is the classical cross entropy loss function for bounding boxes, which is just bounding box reg regression, they're also optimizing for masks where you just have kind of a binary loss, whether the mask is, uh, you know, how close the mask is to ground truth or not. So, end of my tutorial <laughs> on the detection and categorization. So, so this is, I think, super exciting. And in the context of object detection, this uh, has again been driven by a data set, uh, which was the, kind of the ImageNet equivalent data set for, uh, for object detection, which is called POCO, called Common Objects in Context, and has about, um, uh, you know, over 500,000 images, but only 80 object categories. Remember, ImageNet had 20,000 image categories. Why? Now it's really tedious to do the labeling. <laughs> Somebody has to go and notice this is the ground truth information which you need to do have in order to learn the models okay 
So it's okay to do it for 80 categories, but uh, it is tedious. So I'm not going to go on, uh, you know, I'm not going to have a long discussion, but this problem literally spawn an industry of companies who do labeling. Because if you can do it efficiently and reliably, you know, you can outsource it to the labeling. Because, you know, the original, um, original model was, you know, the, you let it, uh, let use the mechanical turkeys to do it, but then you have to deal with a lot of errors. And this is dramatically affecting the, uh, the, method, uh, the performance of your model. Okay, so, so we have two things. The images are usually collected from Flickr, photo sharing sites. So these are not exactly the kind of images you are interested in when you are understanding when you want to do robot perception, right? So it's sort of okay when you're doing uh, image tagging on Facebook, you want to tag that somebody has a birthday or there's a wedding and there are five people and friends, but the, the object categories which are captured, the statistics is very much sort of geared towards this uh, kind of general whatever images people share on internet. There have been big advancements made in autonomous driving. So this idea is sort of extended. So there are now data sets which have similar type of labels uh, for street scenes and uh, applications which are relevant to autonomous driving, but it still covers only a very small uh, part of the statistics of the world we may be interested in. So, so what can we do? So, Oh, sorry, wrong, I'm not. <laughs> so, so before I, I kind of jump into the next topic, so here is just kind of a quick uh, diagram on how things have been improving. So these are the improvements in the accuracy of the detectors. He, this plot is showing you, so it's showing you how, lo how fast is, uh, how many operations per second does it take in order to do a single pass of the network? And uh, the blobs are the number of parameters in the network. So, so you can see that we have everything. We, we have big networks, small networks, low networks, the space is huge, okay? So what I think is promising is that if you take these models, you can actually run, if I can place, start this thing down, these things, in real time on a, so, so this is becoming really applicable in the robotic setting. So, so you can run this fast and you, on a, kind of a powerful laptop with a graphics card. And this, this is going to keep on improving, right? So, so the graphics cards which are being developed, there, there are versions of these models which are being implemented on FPGAs and so forth. Okay. So things are fast more or less accurate for some type of applications given maybe 80 categories, but in general, there are a lot of difficulties. So what are the difficulties? So the difficulties are the following. So, and these are the, you know, well-known difficulties. So one is every data set has a bias. Okay. So if I take an images from the data set of internet images, and I have some sofas or objects, they typically appear in some canonical viewpoints, which are selected by photographers in order to visualize that sofa well. And all these things will creep in into your performance. So if you have a situation that I have, most of my sofas look like this in my training set, if I give it a picture of a sofa like that, the performance dramatically drops. So this is just, if you take the state-of-the-art uh, object detector and you are hoping to apply it in a real-world setting where things move and appear from different viewpoints, the performance drops dramatically. And then these are sort of these canonical uh, problems, uh, which, you know, should make you pause a little bit whether these models are really the good kind of models somehow mimicking how human visual systems work. So if you take, these are some images from the image net data set. And if you do just a simple thing of occluding the monkey by the motorbike, then 
the system becomes extremely confident that this is in fact a person as opposed to a monkey, right? Because of the context of the data set that people always occur with the motorbikes. And, and similarly, there are some more examples of, uh, of again, monkey turning into the, pit, uh, into the person and, and then the handlebars turn into a bird and then this is become this is going to be person and a bird because you have sort of uh, guitar and person commonly a coker and then you have a green and this and that the birds commonly coker and this so these are sort of well known issues so again there is a lot of space and of course um, I mean the community is sort of pushing the idea how to be a little bit more robust to uh, to perturbations like this and notice that these are the type of perturbations you rarely hear about because you typically hear in news about these adversarial attacks that you have some imperceptible, imperceptible perturbation which you cannot see and it confuses the neural network but there are some other difficulties which can be directly traced to the issues and biases of the data set so and you know all of these are super interesting problems and many people work on it Okay, so now what can we do? How can we tackle some of these issues? So, so I have outlined a couple of problems which are related to data sets. So in order to get these highly performant models, we need large amounts of training data. And so the problem is that for many domains, you either do not have the large amounts of training data, or it's very tedious to get the large amounts of training data, or you know, sometimes it, it's not quite possible, right? So if you want to detect cars, then you all, there are a lot of cars and there are a lot of pedestrians, but if I would like to detect your water bottle and find a detector for that, I'm not going to have, uh, you know, 300,000 instances of that. And so, so the question is how we can overcome some of these difficulties of needing large amounts of training data in order to apply these powerful techniques to other problems and more specifically the problems which are really relevant for robot perception. So majority of the examples which I will be talking about are applicable or are motivated by this sort of service robotics setting, right? So imagine that you would like to have a robot and you say, clean my home. So you need to pick up all the objects, figure out what they are and figure out where to put them, right? So you really need to recognize the objects, find them and, um, and then put them at the correct place. So like, for example, this kind of room, which is, you know, a room of some teenager. Fortunately, this is not a room from my house, but you know, this is probably not uncommon that uh, rooms of teenagers look like this. And here is a, like a snapshot for, from, from a kitchen of one of my students that this is also not the kind of clean image you typically see on internet, which are being used for, for creating these data sets. So, so, so we, I'm going to just quickly go through a couple of these ideas because the ideas are very simple, but very effective. So, and so for the robot perception, and we were interested in, well, how can we train these detectors and more specifically, how we can generate large amounts of training data for objects which might be interesting for, for manipulation and, and, and this fetch and deliver tasks. So these are all the, so the objects which we have selected are object instances. So you want to get a particular can of soup or a particular box of cereal and Another characteristic of this object is that they can be picked by a manipulator, right? So we were interested in both finding these and also detecting their pose. And I'm not going to get to the pose part. So what we have done is, and this is, I'll skip this as a video. So what we ha have done is the following. So we decided in, in order to deal with this problem of shortage of training data, we decided to generate the training data synthetically. So, so we have a data set. So for all of these household objects, you have 3D models available, which are texture maps 3D models. So what we have done is we have sort of this large data, data set of scenes, and 
we have used this sort of computer graphics compositing techniques to put these objects in the scene. And so suddenly we have a very fast way how to generate large amounts of training data because we are putting the object there. So we know where the bounding boxes are. In fact, we know where the segmentation masks are. And furthermore, we can put the objects in the right context. And so we use this mechanism to generate the training data, synthetic training data, and then just train, train the standard detectors. So now you can ask, well, so how does it really work? I mean, because, you know, there are a lot of artifacts. You have boundary artifacts. If you are learning the low level filters, this filter is going to pick up these artifacts. So, so the conclusion is it works. And if you were to just remember two things, I think two, two things, two interesting questions were, do the artifacts matter of the compositing and the other, does the context help, right? Because I could have maybe also put these objects outdoors and so forth. And the answer to both is yes. So the artifacts matter. And in order to um, remove or make this dependence on the compositing artifacts bigger, what has helped is to use a variety of compositing techniques. So this is as if you were to introduce some domain randomization into the compositing such that the network is not tuned to a particular compositing technique. And the context matters just intuitively because you have these objects which appear on a variety of backgrounds. And as we have seen previously, the backgrounds actually is going to affect your performance. Okay, so here is another idea. So th this, this was kind of exciting. But we were kind of put in robotics problems. The, the setup, give me an image and tell me all the objects which are there is often not that interesting, right? It is often that you are looking for a particular object, right? So you want to say, find me a cereal box. That is really the task you are interested in. In many cases, you don't care what other things are there. So we, we were motivated by this question and we were trying to understand whether we can bring this structure of the task into actual design of the architecture. And this is the way how we went about it. So, so the question is, this is the object I'm looking for. I'm going to give you an image and you need to find this object in the scene. And so can you learn how to do that? So this is a little bit different problem because this is a problem where what you are really learning is how to compare two things. Okay, so here is the standard detection pipeline. You take an image, you extract some features, and then you generate the bounding boxes and, uh, and you generate the predictions for the classes of object. Here, what you do is you take an image, you take a scene, you extract some features, which we already know. So these feature boxes, think of it as the head of this convolutional neural networks, which have been pre-trained on image net or whatever, the state of their network. So these are our filters. Um, and, and then what we do is we actually do a correlation in the feature space. So, so you can think of this problem as a classical template matching problem where how do you do template matching? You take an image and you correlate it with the image. But now you want to do it with multiple scales and you don't want to do it with pixels, but you want to do it with the actual complex features which you have learned for the task. So this is sort of kind of a realization of this very, very template, simple template matching idea in this kind of complex learned feature space where you also have the representations of objects at multiple scales. And so once you learn that common embedding, then you, you generate the hypothesis in that correlation state and then regress the bounding boxes um, and the hypothesis. And this actually works uh, remarkably so, well. So the red and white box are different boxes. Pardon? So the red box, the feature extraction from target image and the white box. From... So, 
so here you extract the features from the target image, what you want to detect, extract the features from the scene, then you do correlation of this red box with this black box. You, you um, so this is the result, okay? And then here you generate the hypothesis. And there are some nuances how to sort of deal with the scale and some, some additional steps. But, and I'm saying correlation, but you know, so the, there are just a lot of different ways how you can compare two, two feature vectors. You can do correlation, some other differences, upside, and, and so some combination of these works best. Okay, okay so this is sort of another thing. So th this is just to kind of show you that if you were to do the activations of the region proposal network, then you would have a lot of uh, local extrema. But if you use this network, which is learning how to compare, then you have this uh, sort of more distinguished uh, maximum. So what is, I think, really nice, and these are just sort of the beginnings of these ideas, is that, so if you think of this architecture as a strategy where you are learning how to compare, then you can, in principle, apply it to the objects you have never seen before. Right? Because this is not generating, this doesn't need any labels. This is just saying, now this is this and this is this. Tell me where this thing appears in the image. But you have to start with the targeting now. So. Well, but you, so, so there's training and testing stage. So in the training stage, I teach the network how to compare those thing, two things. In the test, and I can use some number of objects to do that. But in the testing stage, the objects I'm finding can be the objects I've never seen in the training stage. Does it make sense? Maybe the type still would have to be a type of object that you saw. So, yes. Like a serial box or something. But, but uh, you know, so we, we have, to, th this is a small experiment with 30 object instances, but it doesn't have to be just a serial box. So, it, right. So, so this is uh, sort of another kind of idea. So the third idea I will talk about briefly is you always have limitations, right? So you can do it with some accuracy, but you will hit the limitation. And one type of limitation is related to the size of the object. If it's too small, the resolution it really prevents you detecting it. Or a large amount of occlusion, so you don't really see it. So, so we sort of did a little work on this problem. What can I move? Can I move around in order to uh, detect, uh, generate a better detection? So, for example, here I have a bounding box and I have only um, you know, 0 0.12 confidence that this is an espresso maker, but if, you move, if I move closer, then my confidence goes to 0 0.95. So this is something which we would like to do. So, so this is the example of the problem. I just want to, what's the time? Um, so this is an example of the problem where you can use the ability that your agent can move in order to improve the viewpoint and, um, and generate better predictions. So I will, so, so the question here is, which is a non-trivial, how, and I want to learn how to do this. So how am I going to do it? So the problem is with learning is that you need to have this mechanism how to do these repeatable experiments where you can generate large amounts of data. Now the, the things with robots are a little bit tricky, and this is again for a separate discussion. Is that it's really hard to do learning with the robots in a real world. So for this problem and another set of problems. Uh, we actually embarked on some work which um, is uh, related to a creation of a data set which would enable us to do this. And so, so let me tell you a little bit about the data set. So we have um, created a data set where we have taken the robot 
and the, we have an RGBD view, so we have color image and the depth information. And we have taken 12 views, so there are 12 views at each location. And the locations are about 30 centimeters apart. So, so the blue little stars are the locations where the images are taken and, and the, the lines correspond to the viewpoint. So what we have done is basically we have densely sampled the environment uh, and all the possible views, and we have done it for 15 apartments. So what we have now is this uh, data sets of different apartments and different layouts where the view sampling is really dense. So this, um, so it is kind of a discretization of the space but the discretization is fine enough that you can actually generate trajectories by simply moving on the graph and picking up the views. And then you, the displacement between the views is not as, as if you we were moving continuously, but it's good enough. Okay. So we, we use this type of, um, and, and the advantage is that these are real images, no artifacts, and we have RGBD and depth data. So, and in this, um, in this uh, data set, we have all the small object labels because we you know, want to train and evaluate. So this is our ground truth information. And so, so this is just to visualize that how the performance of the detectors dramatically varies as a function of viewpoint. So if I have an object here, which is the hot sauce bottle, the color dots are representing the confidence of the detector as a function of the viewpoint. So notice that when you are very close, you are confident, then here is the one situation you are right in front of it, but you are really not confident because the object is occluded. And then you move a little bit further and then you are again confident. And then if you go further, the confidence drops. Okay. So, so we looked at the problem of how to learn a policy in the reinforcement learning setting where the goal would be to increase the confidence of the detector. And um, it is sort of a quick, uh, so the, there the idea was given an image and set of ground truth bounding boxes. So there was sort of a little bit of a shortcut because this was just the first take on the problem. Uh, learn how to generate the actions in order to maximize the classification score. And so, you know, starting in some location in the training, we have shown the agent several trajectories in these environments to train the policy. And then in the testing, we had a mechanism how to move around and um, attain the better accuracy. Okay. I'm going super fast, uh, but I'll be happy to talk to you about details if you're interested. The policy also works in the teacher space, the input to the policy function. Well, so everything is fine tuned together, right? So the policy is now one big network. And uh, I don't remember, so, so this is, um, so I think we have done a couple experiments. One is where you actually back propagate the gradients to the features as well or you can freeze this network and just learn the network which is using the features. So, but uh, we have experiments with both. Okay, so these are sort of some ideas. So th th this is to visualize what kind of videos can you get when you move around in this data set. Okay, so, so let me tell you one more thing. And this is probably gonna be I will probably slowly wrap up. So, so, so we know how to generate synthetic training data, then we have this mechanism of comparing, but imagine that I would like to really have a setup where I want the robot to learn things by itself. Okay. So I would deploy the robot in some environment and I would like to um, sort of have some mechanism how to overcome these difficulties of the viewpoint variation and kind of go around and simply learn about objects just by exploring the environment. And for that, we use this kind of video. So you would generate trajectories. And what we want to do is we want to use the motion of the robot 
as some sense of self-supervisory signal in order to generate the training data for object detection. So, so let me uh, remind you a little bit what we are going to use to do that. So I mentioned that one of these traditional object detectors, they are very good in generating this object, the category agnostic proposals, right? So they basically generate these bounding boxes, which are some hypothesis about the object for every image, but they're class agnostic. And so this is, uh, you know, again, fairly well established area and this technique works work reasonably well. And, and you, in order to convince yourself why this may be the case, it's not so difficult to tell whether something is an object or not, right? So it's typically, you, it kind of contains some region in the space, it's separated by some occlusion boundary from the background, and so, so the definition of the object is actually not that difficult to learn by afterward, especially when you have a depth sense of, right? So, so we take these proposals, and these are the examples of, of what, and again, so there's a parameter, we take 500 of these, and we would like to know which ones are good object hypotheses. Because some of them, as you can see, there is a huge amount of clutter and so forth. So what we do is we take the consecutive views and we try to match the proposals. So we are basically going to see, you know, is this bounding box, does it project to another bounding box? If they do, then they're likely to be the similar object. And this you can do using simple triangulation. So this is the, this is the story. Right. So you take an object, you know where things are in 3D, you take some hypothesis. <coughs> if you project that hypothesis is another view and there is another hypothesis which kind of looks alike, then you call it a match. And I don't know what it is, they, I don't know what is the feature representation of this match, but this gives me an ability to generate a large number of these matches. So, so here is an example of the boxes which were matched successfully. So notice many of them, uh, many of the boxes disappear because they didn't have a good match. So now, also th 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 these are the, the successful matches, they're color coded. So now what we would like to do is um, the following. So, so each of these bounding boxes has some representation. And via this matching process, what we would like to do is we would like to fine tune this representation such that it's actually close together in that feature space. Right? So, so what we are going to do is we're going to take these examples of these matches and we are going to formulate this so-called metric learning task, which is basically well, let me show you on another example. So what you do is, here is the example. So you give it uh, examples of three boxes and two boxes are the similar pair and the one box looks different. And what you want to do is you want to learn feature representations of these boxes such that the feature representations of the ones which are the same are close to each other and the ones which are from a different, class, or different object are far apart. And this is captured by so-called triplet loss. So these are the, this is the, for the positive pair and the negative pair, and you want to minimize this. So again, I have a loss. I don't need any labels. I only need uh, the examples. I can completely learn the new feature representations. I have automated way how to generate this just by moving around and knowing how to associate things. And I'm not saying that this is trivial. So data association problem is usually very, very difficult, but in this case, we have the depth information and so forth. And so once we do this, we, what happens is that the learned feature representations, you can think of them as some high dimensional vectors in some embedding space. If you do a clustering in that embedding space, then the clusters correspond to new objects. So notice how the, there are these 
sort of color-coded clusters which correspond to the same objects. Okay. So now we are in the position that we can use the first most, most straightforward technique for unsupervised learning, which is clustering. But the trick was is to learn the space where the clustering is done in order to accomplish our task. Okay. And this is the high dimensional space, which is the output of that uh, neural network where the features were learned um, uh, using, uh, using these triplet laws and uh, making sure that the positive examples are next to each other and negative examples are pushed further apart. So this is uh, again super effective and useful technique. It has been used for Say, say matching aerial images to ground views because you know you can really have dramatically different viewpoints. So if you have a mechanism how to generate training examples, then um, th this is quite effective. Okay. I'm gonna, you know, so there is some performance evaluation and you know, so right now we have a very small data set to do that, uh, which we are trying this on because again, it involves this moving, right? So it requires, we need to have these repeatable experiments, but this is also something which we are working on. So just to give you a feeling, this is roughly the performance on the individual object category, object instances. So it's kind of still low. I mean, it's not um, uh, at the level that you would really like to deploy it on a robot, but this is just a statement about how this network performs and how this feature representation performs. There are a lot of improvements which can be made when you kind of integrate it into a whole system. You can do some verification, you can incorporate it into this active, with the active component and so forth. <clears throat> so here are some examples of what we've learned. We've learned that there is a trash can. Trash can was never in our data sets. So we learned a trash can and an object detector for a trash can. We learned uh, the cereal box, uh, we learned how to detect uh, the maple syrup, uh, and this is some, uh, we learned the vent out of all things, right? But this is this was one of the clusters, right? So this is, I think, also interesting. So I'm gonna speed up now, and actually let me wrap up. So. So we also have sort of interesting work on semantic segmentation and some ideas. So the architectures for semantic segmentations are again very different because you want to learn pixel to pixel mapping as opposed to pixel to label mapping or pixel to uh, bounding box and label mapping. The main idea which these architectures exploit is this idea of deconvolution. So you basically, if you do convolutions and pooling, you lose the resolution. So if you want to gain the resolution back, you need to kind of learn the right kind of filters in order to get it back. And it's not properly visualized here, but in order to learn those filters, you actually, there are these networks of connections from these convolution layers back to the deconvolution layers. So, so there is like a lot of architecture engineering magic, which happens in this field. But at some point you have the top performing architecture and uh, you know, that's usually the starting point of the next uh, advancement. And I think one thing which is wonderful is that, you know, people are sort of really willing to share their models and their, their pretend architecture. So this was, I think, was very helpful for the culture to advance. So, here are some ideas of how to do simultaneous semantic segmentation and depth recovery. And I think what is exciting that it really works in complex settings. So here are some outdoors images and you can see how despite of these difficult lighting variations and shadows, the road can be correctly detected and the depth maps are rather coarse because this is kind of a very simple depth recovery technique, but uh, also quite effective. So let me, two more minutes and I'll finish. So I have talked a lot about how to build different perception modules. And historically, the, 
if you take an architecture of an AI agent, you have these components where you have a mapping and then you have a planner and then you have a low level controller and then you have a localizer. And historically, these have been all built by separate researchers and the interfaces were very brittle. Okay, so this was often the reason uh, for, you know, kind of lack of robustness of some of these systems, especially when you want to apply them into the variety of tasks. So, so what I want to leave you with, with a couple of these ideas that if you take these representations, which can be reliably learned, you can actually incorporate them and fine tune them together with the planner and the controller in a kind of a data driven <coughs> manner. And I think this really sort of gives you, gives us an opportunity how to rethink a little bit how this architecture should be sort of put together. Now, I think appeal of some of these methods is that they're still interpretable, they're still modular, but it is nice that you can fine tune them together. Now, the big thing which makes this possible to happen are simulators, because this is something you can do only in simulation, because you need a large number of examples, especially if you do control and planning. So there is a little bit of a comeback when it comes to simulators, and I will be happy to tell you about what the, what the, what the pitfalls are and what the, what the successes are, because as you all know, simulators are not real world. And what can we do in simulators? And if you learn something in simulator, how does it translate to a real world? But uh, I will finish here. I think uh, you know, this is a very exciting field. There are a lot of opportunities. I think a lot of excitement is in this field of self-supervised and unsupervised learning. And um, we are sort of interested in learning these representations, which can be used for control and reusable for multiple tasks, and then they can adapt to new environments. And I just would like to thank all my students and collaborators. Sorry for sort of speeding up a little bit through that last part, but that's all I have. Well, th thank you very much. You're welcome. Yeah, thank you so much for coming and spending the day with us. And we're, um, I know we're going to take you out to lunch, and we've got um, a, a number of folks that I'm sure have questions. We can hit that now, and we'll probably, will there be a question session after lunch as well? Uh, if there's time. Yeah, yes. So, but it, but uh, before we get into all that, I wanted to give you a small gift from Metron. Uh, the, the, so you can remember us. Okay, uh, there's really some segmentation and uh, identification in the house. Okay, awesome. <laughs> thank you. So. People are, are welcome to go at this point, but if those who want to stay and ask questions, uh, yeah. we'll do that. So we've got, we've probably got about 20 minutes for questions right now before we go for lunch. So if you're done, you're welcome to leave. If you have questions and you want to uh, dive down a little bit deeper, if you don't mind, we, we'd like to have some interaction here. So, all right. Yes. Sorry, question. On, on the apartment example, how much of that learning was done purely visually? versus building a 3D map of where all those objects are. Right, so right now, we the learning was only visual. That's what, but that's what the performance of visual only learning is not that good. Right. So, so coincidentally, we are right now working on how to incorporate the map component into the process. In a way, I mean, so, so the, the trick with all these things is how to incorporate it into this kind of differentiable model, right? Because you want to fine tune everything. So, so yes, we are working on it at the moment. Right now, the, the, the visual strategies, you can think of them as reactive strategies with a little bit of a memory, right? So it's basically, oh, I've seen this, let me do this. Or I've seen this in past three steps, this is the action I should take. So, and because we use these semantic representations, they provided a lot of context. For, so, for example, if I'm looking for a microwave and I see a refrigerator, even if the microwave detector sort of fails or has a very low confidence, I can still keep on moving in the right direction. It's not going to steer me to the living room. So, 
I'm just saying, that I don't, you know, there, there are a lot of ways, there are many ways uh, how to improve this. So this was just kind of the first exploration in this direction. And I think mapping is definitely the right kind of thing to do. And I skipped a few things, uh, a few slides along these lines, but. Yeah. And then a separate question is, so in the apartment context, you're training a model specifically for that apartment design and layout. The question is, is there anything that's learned that might be transferred if I were to go into a new apartment? This is a very good observation. Space? So for the self-supervised learning where I'm moving around, this is exactly what's happening. You are training it just for the department. So now if you take that model and try it on another apartment, it's not gonna perform that as well as on the first apartment because it learns a little bit about the context in which the objects appear. And it doesn't really use layout that much because it's only about the visual appearances and the embeddings of objects. Uh, yes, so here is an opportunity to either have some kind of domain adaptation or transfer learning techniques. And this is also something which we are sort of interested in exploring, but we haven't done it. But your observation is definitely correct. And for the for the application at hand, you know, so there is this question, you know, how, how should we do this, right? Should we have one model which works in all apartments or should we have the ability to really fine tune something for the place where the robot will likely open it for extensive periods of time? So, and like, what, where's the, the I, to me, it's like this kind of slider that you want to sort of decide what is the right model to start with. But you always, I think, should strive to fine tune it for the place where you are at. So you, you still want your large data set for this model to be adaptive to different scenes. It's just, you don't have to label the yeah. images from this data set, yeah. but you yeah. still have to send it. I, I need to, I need to gather the data. Yeah. And, and in a lot of this domain adaptation and transfer learning, you know, so there is again, class of techniques. Sometimes you need to label very small number of examples. You know, so the question is, what is the right level of super supervision? Maybe you can align some trajectories and let the agent figure out. So, so there are a lot of small ideas which try to look for ways how to um, come up how to avoid labeling by using loss functions which are rooted in some ideas of temporal consistency, temporal alignment, structural alignment. So if, if it's easy to gather examples, like for example, if I have two temporally aligned trajectories and I know that they are of the same thing, uh, then there are ways how to propagate the individual, how to generate these pairs of examples without labeling individual frames and this type of things. Other questions? Uh, when you're training the model where you're telling it what to look for, do you train, so you have the like feature extraction part and then the part that actually looks at, I guess, the apartment, right? And then you have the part where you kind of combine those. Do you train it all at once? Or are you doing it so in this case, I think we have tried both, but uh, I don't remember exactly what was the performance. Usually we freeze the feature part, right? So it is, but the thing is, it is a possibility to bike propagate the features all the way. So this, how you choose to do that depends a little bit you know, how specific you want to have it for a particular environment versus how you want to generalize, how you want to just maybe learn the policy for using these features. So um, it a little bit depends, but it is possible to back, back propagate the gradients all the way. I don't, I don't think we do it in this case. Once you try to combine this each extraction and control algorithm, does it mean that have to use reinforcement learning because it's hard to yeah. design a PAT control in the yeah. feature space, yeah. right? Yeah. So pretty much yeah. stuck with, yeah. with yeah. reinforcement learning once you move the feature. Yeah. Is that the yeah. case? Yeah. So yes, we use reinforcement learning. Um, I can tell you one 
very recent observation. So in reinforcement learning, the challenge is how do you design the reward, right? And if you open the book, the reinforcement learning book, you get the reward at the end, right? So, so there is this problem of sparse rewards, which everybody is trying to tackle. And if you have sparse rewards, then you know you have to do so much learning and you have no signal. So, so if you have a well-defined control task for which, say, a feedback controller exists, then, then you can use the feedback error as a part of the reward. And then it is still uh, reinforcement learning, but now it's almost like a supervised because you are giving it a feedback at every instance of time. So you can think of a reward for certain class of problems that feedback error can be can play a function of a reward, yet it still gives you an ability to fine tune everything together. So this is one idea. The other idea is, okay, I have the reward at the end, but let me set up some auxiliary tasks. Right? So people, for example, are learning how to navigate where they get the reward only at the end, but in order to generate gradients for their networks to back propagate, they're at this, on the side, they're learning how to reconstruct, recognize objects, <laughs> and all these sort of other tasks just to, to help the navigation. Yeah, so there's a lot of um, explorations one can do in this space. You know, sometimes you're motivated by the task, sometimes you're motivated by sort of maybe some cognitive psychology and trying to understand how people learn their rewards which are related to intrinsic motivation and, and boredom and things like this. But it depends a little bit on the application domain. Like, you know, for, for this uh, robot wandering uh, around in the environment, everything goes. I mean, it's not a safety critical application. It's very different when you have a safety critical application. Could you talk a little bit about why you chose to use like, real data instead of synthetic data? Is that a, a choice that was driven by just it was easier to get, or is it? Uh, you mean for the for the moving around, yeah, for scanning like, the apartment? Like imagining you could build yeah. a virtual world that was. So yes, so we have used also simulated data. So we were really interested in the instance detection task, which is you know these little bottles and boxes because this was a project related to mobile manipulation. So you want to kind of pick up things. So the simulated environments are great. However, they're a little bit sanitized. They don't have too many objects in them. So they're very good for this um, kind of navigation and mapping task. And they have realistic layout, but they don't quite have realistic clutter. You know, so if you look at this countertop, there is no simulated environment which has that kind of amount of clutter. The, the lighting is usually very clean. So this was our motivation and, and we wanted to, I mean, so yes. So, and at that time when we started it, the, the, the new wave of simulators was not around yet. So now in past two years, there's been huge developments in the, in the improvement of the simulator. But they still don't have this small object. So it was just the choice of problem which we were interested in. So like when you're, as you're progressing in your research, how much of it is limited by, say, say for example, you could snap your fingers and have a thousand environments with, you know, all the data you want, and it's just down to figuring out what to do versus how much of it is messing with the kind of dirtiness of I have to collect some data to work. So I think um, for certain kind of uh, tasks, the simulated environment, we can be happily inter entertained for a while in the simulated environments because things are hard. I mean, they're still hard. It's not like we know how to do it 99%. I mean, with the 99% accuracy, whatever the task is, especially when you consider you know, the more realistic the simulation gets, the harder it is, even in simulation. So for a lot of these navigation tasks, 90% of the approaches assume that they have a perfect localization. This is not the realistic assumption, 
right? So, so you always kind of add this level of difficulty. <clears throat> Another challenge with simulation is, you know, when it comes to contact and moving things around, current simulators can't do it. So I, I think the simulators will become better and better and more visually realistic and better variations of lighting. We can do things there and then worry about how to transfer it. But when it comes to problems where you really need the physical interaction, then I think this is, we have just recently started thinking about it. The problem is that the simulator is become, is going to be so complex that you will not be able to run it fast enough to do it, right? Because I mean, th imagine that if you want to simulate all the friction and contact and, 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 and detection, then at some point, so, so and these these things are kind of proceeding hand in hand, right? So, so some of these simulators. I mean, if you want to train these reinforcement learning algorithms, I mean, you have to be able to generate the renderings at sixty frames per second. Otherwise, and so now, if, if we, and so this is for like a really simplistic uh, renderings, which are not visually realistic. But if you increase the a level of visual realism, and you wanna simulate the perception, then is not, you're not going to be able to generate the rendering to 60 frames per second. So it's, there is, um, you know, there is another clan of, uh, I guess I should not call it clan, but there's another <laughs> group of researchers. So th there is this kind of push and pull, right? Oh, you know, let's not do the simulation. We should learn everything from real data. So there is a push, um, well, but you know, if I have a $50,000 robot, I don't want the robot to be crashing and banging <laughs> and doing things, uh, you know, 50,000 trials because so, so there's a little bit exploration for certain tasks to have these inexpensive platforms you can train. You know, so some of the quadrotors, I mean, you know, there are, you can get something for $40, right? So you can bank them with, uh, like, so, so it depends on the problem space a little bit. Yeah. So the synthetic environment thing makes me, makes me think of first person video games like Skyrim or Battlefield yeah. or Call of Duty, those are very dirty. Yes, 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 yes. They're all used, by the way, for, yeah. Uh -huh. And then the other question I was, um, sensors, uh, this is all optical, but things like imaging sonar or LIDAR, are people yes. heading down those paths? It, I have it somewhere on my hidden slide. So so this is, uh, so two things which are exciting is, so these uh, models for learning features from data that is, have been developed also for LIDAR point sets. Architectures are very different, but they are there. You can have architectures which take multiple views, flows, and things like this. So it's a good vehicle for fusing sensors, sensory measurements, and learn in some sense how to fuse it. Um, yes, yeah, so this is, uh, yeah, there, there's sort of quite a bit of research in this area. Is there labeled data sets for radars, for example, or proximity for sensors? Radars, there, I'm, there are some for, a lot for LIDARs, and I have recently seen some released data set on radar, but I am not sure at which level it is labeled. But then, you know, so another class of problems people look at is like you have one data set which is labeled and the other one which is not labeled but it's synchronized. This is kind of relevant for navigation. So, so there, you can kind of, uh, kind of distill the knowledge from one sensor to another via some uh, sort of learning techniques. All right, anybody else? Thank you. Oh, uh, I was wondering if you have any guesses as to why the identification success of the rice bag was so low on one of your slides. It yes, 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 it was very low. So, I think the problem with the rice bag is that it's very kind of non-rigid object which is packed in this shiny <laughs> plastic. So it, it basically has a lot of these both appearance, viewpoint, and rigidity artifacts, which uh, are sort of decreasing the performance of the detector. And it's also in very kind of non-canonical viewpoints, right? So for some of these, uh, 
So for bottles, the viewpoint doesn't matter so much, right? So boxes, if you have thrown them aside and you're okay, but the rice bags can, it can be almost in any position, arbitrarily occluded and so, so the non-rigid objects is a big problem, right? So then how do you, this is also for manipulation, how do you, it's not so trivial to do the learning. Um, then if you want to do simulation, then you are in the, the finite element world where you have to do it. So, so these are sort of uh, additional challenges. Okay, so, so I'd like to <clears throat> call on end of this, this session. Uh, Dana, would you be available at the two o'clock? Yeah, People yeah. Are going to talk to you? Okay, so in this room at two o'clock, we want to continue the discussion with, with Yana, she will be here. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Presentation. It's very, very relevant to the sort of work that you do. Like to do. So this is going to be a good one.